has been working with property owners in that community trying to clean up the problems from adding cameras to additional security. Unfortunately, the neighborhood has been a hot spot for continued issues. A serious situation for Columbus police early Friday along Canopy Place. Officers responding to a call about a fight in the area. They say when they tracked down the suspect, Ricky Teague, he pointed a gun and fired in their direction before running off, locking himself in his apartment before later being arrested. Thankfully, no officers were hurt. This incident, just the latest in a string of trouble in the South Franklinton community, we've been tracking for months. Community members like Angela Bird, one of those we've profiled, pushing for change and continued help from city leadership. Come out here and check it out for yourself. Like, spend a day with us, you know, like come sit in the park with me, you know, to see, observe and see what's going on. City Attorney Zach Klein has maintained for some time he's committed to cleaning up problems here. We won't be happy to reach out, of course. Like, I have an open door policy in the city. Like, I, I love hearing from residents because they're my boss and, you know, I have a duty to them. Ricky Teague, the suspect arrested in this latest incident on Canopy Place, faces a long list of charges. We looked into his background and he has a pretty lengthy criminal history as well. He's set to be in court on his latest charges Saturday morning. Rodney Dunnigan reporting. 17-year-old Imperial Stewart was last seen Wednesday of last week. In that time, a lot more questions than answers. Police working to gather clues. His family hitting the streets, hopeful they will hear something soon. We need to find my grandson. I need peace. I need to know where he is. Emotional but firm in their faith, loved ones of Imperial Stewart gathering in Nelson Park on the east side Tuesday, searching, passing out flyers, trying to solve a painful mystery. He's just an awesome kid. Like, I was, I'm just lucky to have him and I want him back. The family and police looking for tips any information. Stewart was last seen near Cleveland Avenue and Huey Road. The only clue investigators have to go on, a black 2006 Chrysler 300 that could be connected to the teen's disappearance. We're told the vehicle has a temporary tag of R05661. I just want him home so we can have peace so my family can rest because I'm not going to stop looking for him until we fight. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> We're going to keep looking for my grip. <laughs> We're going to find him. A nervous family hoping for the best, but understandably fearing the worst. Rodney Dunnigan, Reporting. It's been nearly three years since the fatal shooting of Casey Goodson Jr., but the heartache is still fresh for his family. Where am I? Where am I Turning their pain into positive action for others. I just pray. I know that in the end, that guy got us. There you go. Thank you. And chips. The family of Casey Goodson Jr. gathering in downtown Columbus Wednesday, serving meals to the less fortunate, giving back in his honor as they work to heal. Thank you. We always want to make sure we're giving back for the support and love that we, we receive. Their personal day of service coming after word of a delay in the trial of former Franklin County Deputy Jason Mead. He's facing murder charges in connection with Goodson's death. Mead claims Goodson was turning toward him and pointed a gun. There is no body cam footage of the shooting. As loved ones of Goodson wait for the case to move forward, in the honor of my son who was murdered by the police, Casey Goodson Jr. they plan to keep his name in the public light. I tell people all the time, I don't allow myself to feel the loss of Casey because I'm afraid if I allow myself to feel, I won't be able to fight. We reached out to the special prosecutor's office for insight on why the trial was delayed. I was told per practice, they cannot comment. Rodney Dunnigan reporting. That emergency hearing going down Thursday afternoon, board members saying that Republican-backed overhaul of K-12 education violates the state constitution. This case we brought forward is about democracy, accountability, and transparency. The education overhaul has been controversial since it was first introduced in the legislature last year. We are here today uh, for the initial TRO hearing. Thursday, an emergency hearing on a temporary restraining order filed against the governor's takeover of the State Board of Education. There are three provisions of the Ohio Constitution which are at issue here. 
The suit filed by several members of the board along with the national legal organization Democracy Forward. What the legislature did in the 11th hour during the budget um, took away 11 million people's voices. Some of the GOP-backed changes they're fighting include a director appointed by the governor. As a part of the process, many of the board's other powers will be transferred to that new director, and the department would be renamed the Department of Education and Workforce. We spoke with Lieutenant Governor John Husted, who says this lawsuit is only hurting students and families. It's going to further delay leadership in helping improve the quality and accountability of the education system in Ohio if it goes forward. Uh, these seven state school board members that filed the lawsuit have failed over the last two years to hire a permanent superintendent. They have left the Department of Education leaderless for two years. Ohio's school children and our education system and the economy suffer when they fail. This is a battle both sides say is for the future of education here in the Buckeye State, each side indicating they want what's best for students. Rodney Dunnigan reporting. Auto worker strike continues to push forward. There's a real fear that vehicle supplies will eventually head down and prices will be heading up. Local dealerships are putting plans in place to keep their operations moving. For the first time in history, a sitting president set to join the picket lines. President Biden planning to meet with striking United Auto Workers in Michigan on Tuesday. Here in Ohio, a GM plant in Westchester and a Stellantis plant in Streetsboro have joined the already striking Stellantis plant in Toledo. The strike now growing to 38 locations in 20 states. Rick Reichert, president of Reichert Automotive, says from a price perspective, buyers won't feel the brunt of this strike, at least not right away. We usually carry about a two month supply of new vehicles. We, we ramped up to about a 90 day, mm. uh, just in case it carries on that long. But what about service? With the possibility of parts being in short supply, will customers be able to get needed repairs? Yeah, I, I think there's enough parts supply right now that we're gonna be good for you know, the next month or two. As far as negotiations, Ford saying in a statement, talks with the UAW gained ground in some areas, but significant gaps remain. Stellantis saying it will continue to bargain in good faith and that they presented a competitive offer, but the union never responded. It's not fair. It's really corporate greed. They making the money. They can pay us. The union is demanding raises of more than 40% and better benefits. And as you heard from that worker, they continue to point to CEO pay raises and record profits that the three companies have earned in recent years. Rodney Dunnigan reporting. Attorneys for the family of Joseph Haynes tell us the past few years have been rough for loved ones of the teen. They say the entire situation could have been avoided and no amount of money will ever fill the hole left in their hearts. Resolution approving the settlement, legal claims, and authorizing the county administrator to execute a settlement agreement and release in the amount of $6,500,000. This week, Franklin County Commissioners giving the okay to a huge settlement with the family of 16-year-old Joseph Haynes. My son! My son! The teen shot and killed by Deputy Richard Scarborough back in 2018 outside of a juvenile courtroom. The county will pay $6.5 million to the Haynes family, their attorneys giving us insight on the deal. You know, this, this event was particularly traumatic for them because it was not just losing a loved one, but his family witnessed it. The deadly shooting sparked after the teen's family got into a fight with the deputy. Haynes was shot in the process. A grand jury deciding the shooting was justified. It's been a challenge for this family. The, the, not, not just losing your child and a loved one, but uh, waiting five years to get answers, uh, to find justice and to find a resolution. It's been, uh, it's been trying for this family, but... Um, they're ready to move forward. County commissioners releasing a statement to us saying in part, with this settlement, the county is moving forward from a difficult situation. We want to acknowledge the tragedy of the Haynes family's loss and also the challenge that deputies face. Moved and seconded voting. Commissioner Crawley. Yes. Commissioner they went on to say they decided to settle on the advice of the county's attorneys.
A spokesman for the county tells us this settlement ends all legal claims brought against the county, not only bringing closure to residents, but protecting tax dollars in connection with any future legal actions. Rodney Dunnigan reporting. The U.S. women's amputee soccer team has been on quite a run. The team fresh back from Poland after taking second place in their tournament. Not only are they winners in the sport, but in the game of life. Their mission is to inspire and to push others to greatness. This is a dream. Like I, if someone would have told me seven years ago, you get your leg cut off and you're going to become like this major sports person, I wouldn't have believed it. I'd have been like, yeah, you're dreaming, not going to happen. LaQuinta Haynes has been on quite the roller coaster in life. She could have never imagined losing her leg to cancer would lead her on a journey to becoming a world-class athlete. I feel like my story, it could help a, a lot of other people come out of that depression stage. Basic passing. And we followed her story and that of her teammates like Katie Bondi. Every day is going to be a challenge just based off of what you are going through, but I like taking that challenge and, you know, seeing how I can solve that problem and just going forward and keep moving forward and that's life. The team back in the States following a world tournament in Poland, not only showing off their skills, but sharing their stories with others a world away. Haynes telling us the experience was amazing, taking away the tournament's Impact Player Award. You the team's push, not simply about victories, but helping others conquer their struggles in life as well. This life for me is way better than the life before I got an uh, amputation. Like I was just living to live then. Now I'm living to like live. Players say this entire experience has been one they will never forget. For most, the game of soccer, a fun hobby, but their work to shine a positive light for others is now their true life's work. Rodney Dunnigan, report.